There we go. Okay, as Dave said, I am the chairman of the Society's Modeling Committee. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a fifth generation railroader. If you count a, a brother or two in that uh, five count, uh, I run commuter trains in and out of Chicago's little South Street Station on the old Rock Island. So uh, enough about me, let's get to what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about these Lakeshore, Michigan Southern and subsidiary depots that were built between 1894 and 1904. Um, next slide here. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, who's taken a picture and documented experiences and especially shared them. You know, uh, I was actually born in the Conrail era um, without people sharing their experiences and photos. Uh, none of this would have been happening today. So uh, thank you to everyone that's taken care of that. So what we're going to look at today, uh, there was two types of brick and stone depots on the Lakeshore, Michigan Southern, and uh, subsidiaries. Um, we're not going to look at the, we'll take two seconds and look at the one type, but uh, focus on the second type here. So a uh, um, couple variations of the depot, and as it's been said before, uh, identical but different. Uh, and then toward the end, we're going to look at uh, the HO scale and N scale versions of this depot and uh, how to take a hacksaw to them and cut them apart and make them a little bit different. So where were these located? As we know, the, uh, the Lakeshore Michigan Southern stretched from Buffalo to Chicago, some branches in Michigan, some branches in Ohio, a couple branches in Indiana. All these dots here represent uh, um, the brick and stone depots. The blue dots represent the, the uh, the one depot that we'll quickly touch on. The orange dots represent the small versions of the depot. The red dots uh, represent the larger versions. And then the yellow dots represent uh, variations of those depots. And we'll look at each one of these real quick. Uh, and as uh, we said before, both in Dave and Jeff's presentation, the Lake Erie and Western was a uh, subsidiary till 1922. And there was uh, three versions uh, three examples on the Lake Erie and Western, and uh, the original New York, Chicago, and St. Louis, the nickel plate also stretched from Buffalo to Chicago, sometimes paralleling just a couple hundred foot from the uh, Lakeshore, Michigan Southern, and that was uh, 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 control until 1916 when it was sold, sold off and divested. So this is the first type of depot that we're just going to take a look at. This is Wauseon, Ohio. Um, I'm calling it a high peaked dormer, as you can see here, high peak dormer and some of the details. The high peak dormers on, has a stone band all the way around right above the windows, arched windows on the uh, top of the side windows. And uh, uh, there's no stone between the windows. And then the uh, 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 um, um, brackets here, is just one single post running from the uh, pillar, I guess you would call it, up to the to the roof. So this is the depot that we're going to look at. I'm calling a low dormer uh, version. This one happens to be at Sturgis, Michigan. And the low dormer, you can see the dormer is not as tall as the other one with three little windows, a square window and then a uh, arching window in the center. So some of the details that we're uh, looking at here, as I said, stone between the windows, the bottom below the windows is all stone, stone in the corners, stone around the windows, and then the brackets here have a vertical post and then the angled post with a post connecting to the top. And there's two versions, either a large version or a small version of this depot. So on the small version up here, we have a paired window, an entry door, the wood bay window, or the wood operator's bay, an entry door, and then a paired window. Then on the larger versions, a paired window, a second paired window, the entry door, the operator's bay, another entry door, paired window, and paired window. On the ends, got the smaller version, just a, paired, a single window and the baggage door. And on the larger versions, a single window, the baggage door, and a single window. On the, the other end of the depot, on the smaller versions, 
have two pairs, two single windows, and then on the larger versions, a bank of three windows with stone between where the smaller version has brick and stone between. And then on the street side of the depot, just like the, the front side of the, or the track side of the depot, single window, entry door. Uh, this is two high windows for the restroom, single entry door, and a paired window with the large version, paired window, paired window, entry door, um, the restroom, entry door, paired window, paired window. And the difference on the street side here is the smaller depots had this little bump out section where the larger depots, since they were a little bit wider, did not need that. And we'll look at that in a minute here. Actually, this slide right here. This is from uh, the Stryker Historical Society. And you can see a general waiting room on one side, the ticket office operator's bay in the middle, the men's restroom on one side, the ladies restroom on the other side connected to the larger waiting room, and then a, a men's waiting room on one side with a little baggage end on the other. So you can see an entry door here into the men's waiting room, entry door here into the, the general waiting room, and same thing on the street side of the depot. So our first example here is at Westfield, New York, uh, 58 miles from Buffalo. Uh, this is about a 1915 depot, uh, or sorry, 1915 photo. Uh, this depot was built in 1904. Um, we'll look at here in a minute. Uh, earlier postcard, this depot is different from all the other ones as it had an inner urban. The uh, Johnstown, Westfield, and Northwestern ran out of this depot from 1914 to 1950. And then you can see here the Ch Chicago attraction on English Street, also in front of the depot. Another view, this one looks, uh, I believe, east with the Chicago attraction in the, in the front. And again, another street side view. Another view, uh, looking this one looking west. A 1946 view with the Empire State Express uh, in front of the depot. Uh, looks like a, 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 a passenger car with a freight motor alongside here. A 1968 photo uh, from Chuck Bowie. Um, you know, still in, in railroad use. But here's a modern. Uh, photo. Um, this one differs, as you can see here, the passenger end, but on the, the freight end, instead of two paired windows, it actually has an extended baggage room for, uh, I believe, for the inner urban. So paired window, paired window, entry door, entry door, paired window, but then single window, baggage door, and single window. The, the track side looks almost uh, the mirror to this, with uh, the end being the same as a, uh, a standard single window door, single window. Again, you know, it's it's on the main line, so uh, operated by CSX today. And then another street side view, you can see the paired window, paired window door, restroom door, paired window, and then the extended baggage room. Inside, uh, it's now operated as a art gallery and an event center. Moving on uh, about uh, 15 miles further west to Northeast Pennsylvania, we have a standard short depot, smaller depot, postcard view. Again, the uh, Empire State Express passing in front of the depot. Again, a 1971, uh, I believe it's a Chuck Bowie photo, you know, baggage cart still on the, on the platform. And then this is a 2007 photo of what the depot kind of looks like today. You know, the, the single window and door on the baggage end, paired window, door, operator's bay, and then so forth back on the other end. Another view looking back uh, on the other side of the depot. This door here uh, was originally a window, as we saw in that earlier postcard view that was cut in at some time. And a street side view with the little restroom uh, bump out here. Again, uh, 
Northeast happens to be a one of the planned stops on the, the canceled um, bus trip for the previous convention. So this is why I originally put this presentation together is to look at these depots since the Northeast and uh, I forget the other one would have been stops on the uh, bus tour. A little nice little train layout inside, memorabilia. And of course, being uh, just a few miles from Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, the Railroad Museum has a nice collection of General Electric locomotives which were built uh, there in Erie and New York Central U-25B happens to be parked outside. Skipping down a little bit to Conneaut, Ohio. Another postcard view. This one happens to be a large um, depot. Can't really see it in the postcard view, but you know, the standard uh, baggage in. Another postcard view. The street side, you can see it's just a standard large depot. Another uh, late 60s, early 70s Chuck Bowie photo from the Society's archives. 2010 photo, uh, again, this was the other stop on the bus tour as a uh, another railroad museum that's been, con or the depot's been converted to a, the railroad museum. Street side view. And uh, Conneaut being a large nickel plate steam shop and division point, uh, nickel plate Burke is uh, parked outside. A little further down the line, uh, milepost 137, Geneva, Ohio. This one happens to be a large depot. Let me check my notes here. Yep, uh, this one was built in 1900. Uh, the, uh, for, what I forgot to mention is uh, the baggage sides varied on the left and the right. This one happens to have the baggage side on the right, the waiting room, the large waiting room on the left here. Uh, northeast. Going back there a second, had the left side baggage, and uh, Westfield had the baggage on the right hand side. Another view of Geneva. Um, let me look at my notes here. Built in 1900. There's no known photographs that I found of a street side of this. Uh, thing I forgot to mention earlier is with the the gable of the the uh, um, not the gables, the uh, uh, dormers. Most of the depots had dormers on the track side only. We'll look at a couple examples. Uh, Westfield had one on the street side, but uh, most of them only had the dormers on the track side. So um, where are we at? We're at Geneva. I was not able to find a photo of the street side, so I can't tell you if this one had a dormer on the street side or not. Unfortunately, this depot was raised in about 1968, so uh, we can't uh, tell. Down on the Oil City branch uh, in western central Pennsylvania, uh, milepost 7.9, another large depot. Uh, this one happens to be built uh, in 1901, and it had a trackside dormer only. There's no dormer on the street side, and the baggage end was on the right-hand side of the depot. Another view of the of the depot looking the other direction. 1968 Chuck Bowie photo. You can tell that the windows have all been boarded up and uh, probably converted to a maintenance away office for the track inspector or uh, um, track crews. 1999 photo. Uh, I think this happens to be about the the last uh, decent photo of the the building as. Uh, a daycare has purchased the building, uh, this 2015 photo, and has had an addition added to it. Looking at a Google satellite view, here is the actual depot and a daycare addition over here and a daycare addition over here. And this whole area here is fenced in uh, for the kids to play in. So uh, the depot has not looked like it did in the, in the past. It's, uh, Moving to the other side of uh, Toledo, to Delta, Ohio, milepost 318 on the main line, we have a, another standard small depot. Uh, Delta, 
I don't know when that one was built. Uh, it's got the trackside dormer on only. And the baggage is uh, on the right-hand side. And my notes say it has orange bricks, which we'll see here in a, in a second. Uh, another 1969 photo from a, from a Chuck Bowie. Um, just check my news feed here. Um, uh, Paul asked about Ashtabula. We'll get to Ashtabula toward the end. Um, 1985 Conrail View um, looks looks a little ragged, you know, for its age. And then this I shot last year, and it uh, turns out to be really ragged. If this uh, depot doesn't survive another three or four years, I wouldn't be surprised. It uh, sits at the end of a, a Dead end road, kind of surrounded by trees, off in the middle of nowhere, where some of the other depots are right in town. You know, uh, this one's not showing the love of the uh, the neighborhood and the community. If we'll take a look, just walk around. The baggage end is on this end. The waiting room is on this end. View from the other direction, the baggage door. The end. Uh, moving a few miles down, 20 miles down to Stryker, Ohio. This depot was built in 1900. Again, it's got the trackside dormer only, and the baggage is on the left-hand side. Nineteen sixty-seven Chuck Bowie photo. Again, the windows are boarded up. Probably maintenance away, track inspector use. But this depot happens to sit uh, on a busy in-town road, and uh, it's been nicely restored by the Stryker Historical Society. Just a quick walk around the depot. Okay, moving up into Michigan. Uh, the original Toledo and Jackson Railroad ran from Toledo to Jackson, and the Southern Michigan, the Southern Railroad of Michigan ran from Monroe, Michigan, uh, till it ran out of money in uh, the Hinsdale area, where the two crossed is Lenaway Junction. Uh, when New York Central wanted to complete the line uh, from Buffalo to Chicago, the original main line came up here to Lenaway Junction, and then west along the Southern Railroad of Michigan, back to Hillsdale and then towards Chicago and Elkhart. So this became known as the Old Road Branch when the mainline airline was built between Elkhart and Toledo uh, in the 18, late 1860s, early 1870s. So the Old Road came up to Lenaway Junction and then went west from there. Lenaway Junction Depot is a little bit odd. You see the main line here, uh, this is toward Toledo Walk to the to the right, Elkhart to the to the rear. This train over here is sitting on the old Southern Railroad of Michigan uh, track to Monroe. Have an operator's bay you know, on this side, paired window, operator's door, and we'll see it a little bit later. But no uh, dormer on either side of the depot. We'll take a look here at uh, another photo. This one looks east again. The track here heads off to Monroe. To Toledo, and this Y connection goes up to Jackson. Again, here's the the track to Monroe, and this is the opposite side of the depot. It has an operator's bay on both sides of the depot, but uh, it only has a single waiting room. If we'll see here in the next slide, uh, this Jim Finley photo from the Doug Leffler collection. This train here, we're kind of looking back west. Paired window, entry door, operator's bay, paired window, and the end here. So uh, most depots have a double entry door on either side of the operator's bay, where this one does not. I have not been able to find a photo of this end, so I don't know if it was a baggage, more than likely a baggage door and a window, but uh, which side of the baggage door was on, I couldn't tell you. Again, looking back east, track to Monroe, 
the main line to Toledo is back over here. Again, the windows are boarded up. Uh, I'm not really sure about this date, but probably in the Penn Central era, 1970s. Uh, this 1976 photo, the depot uh, is in sad shape from Doug Leffler. And uh, fortunately, that's the last uh, photo I've been able to find of it. Here, here's the track layout from Google Earth toward Toledo, a Y track comes up, this heads up to Jackson. This is uh, to Hinsdale and uh, um, east eventually to, or west eventually to Elkhart in Chicago. Y connection here. And then the branch to Monroe stays on the south side of Deerfield Road, goes to, goes east here. A Couple miles back, uh, almost, South Central Michigan, we come to Sturgis, Michigan, milepost 400 on the old road. Uh, again, that's from Buffalo. Early 1900s postcard view. Um, change my notepad here. Uh, this depot actually was built, uh, one of the early ones, it built in 1896. Um, again, a dormer on the track side only. And the baggage is on the left-hand side is viewed from the track side. Another postcard view, look in the other direction. In Sturgis, the uh, Pennsylvania subsidiary, the Grand Rapids and Indiana crossed. Um, so the tower controlling the uh, crossing is we're looking at, looking back east toward the depot. Uh, probably have a, I believe that's an H46, a 280, or G46, 280 coming up on the uh, connection track here. 1970 Chuck Foley photo. It looks at halfway in a halfway decent condition. 1984 photo. And again, this is kind of in town, just a couple blocks north of downtown. So it kind of showed some love uh, from the community. And in 2014, it got jacked up and, and moved to a, a nicer location on, on uh, the main street in town. And its current location, when I first visited in 2014, I went to the location and saw a pile of uh, foundation rubble. And I'm like, oh no, they tore it down. Well, turns out they moved it about four blocks away. And it's been nicely restored uh, by the historical, the Sturgis Historical Society. We'll just do a quick walk around, you know, the baggage, the baggage end, the waiting room end. And uh, the Historical Society put uh, uh, historic photos in the windows. So that's what you're seeing here is historic photos from, uh, from the county in the windows. And a Doug Leffler photo uh, on the inside, you know, it's uh, the historic, the county historical society or the city historical society, uh, you know, trying to tell the uh, the history of the the town. So you know, the railroad, and then uh, you know, pre uh, pre probably statehood photos. So it's you know, it's a true historical museum. About 15 miles down the road, on the old road, we come to uh, White Pigeon, Michigan. Uh, this one is the earliest one, built in 1894. And uh, when the conductor said that he had to run into the depot to do an errand, he did not mean to take the uh, G46 with him. So uh, we'll see here in a minute uh, what uh, some of the results that still last today from this uh, derailment. I haven't been able to figure it out, but uh, this G46 was scrapped in, where'd it go? Uh, I believe it was 1923. So this derailment happened before 1923. Yeah, 1923, G43, um, my mistake. Again, uh, this 1970 photo, it kind of looks a little run down. The windows are boarded up, but uh, 1984 looks like it had a new roof installed. So it's showing some love. But today, it's been uh, completely restored by the, the city and used as a community center. Going back to the derailment here, we can see the yellow bricks on some side here, but then gray bricks 
on the rest of the depot. So the entire front end, all the way up to the paired window, has been rebuilt from the derailment damage. This one also, like Lenaway Junction, paired window, entry door, operator's bay, and then paired window. There is no waiting room on the one side of the depot. Again, uh, this is the, would be the uh, looking back east, yellow bricks, and then a repaired darker brick from the derailment. Quick walk around the street side. You see no entry door, but a single window instead of a paired window on, on the street side of this depot. Then you can see the different color bricks from the yellow and the gray. Well, moving a little further down, this time uh, we're just west of Elkhart at Mishawaka, Indiana. Milepost 432 on the main. A um, little bit different. Originally, um, if you go back to 412 to 432, it's not 20 miles difference. It's more like 40 miles. Um, the Originally, the uh, uh, both of them are from Buffalo. Both mileposts are from Buffalo. The airline between Elkhart and Toledo is a lot shorter by about 20 miles. So that's the uh, difference in the mileposts. Mishawaka 19, uh, postcard view. It's a short depot, standard features. No dormer on the street side of the, the depot. Another postcard view. Again, the, uh, the, uh, the baggage room is on the left-hand side as viewed from the track. A Eugene Van Dusen photo from uh, Morning Sun Books, 1953, pair of brand new F7s pulling a freight likely out of Elkhart uh, heading towards Chicago. 1963 photo. Uh, unfortunately, right after this photo uh, in the 1970s, this depot was raised. Moving to Indiana Harbor, milepost 502 on the main line. Indiana Harbor was also the connection the junction from uh, the Chicago, Indiana, and Southern, uh, sometimes known as the uh, unofficially the Egyptian line running from Indiana Harbor down to Danville. Early postcard view, it's a large depot with a dormer on the track side only. See in the street side, no dormer. Uh, the baggage room is on the left hand side. This view, looking back east, the depot is right here. Uh, y connection to the Indiana or Chicago, Indiana Southern. This track here heads off to plant one of the Inland Steel Company, four track main line. This happens to be the B and O over here, and the EJ and E uh, South Chicago branch. Actually, you see these uh, high tension towers. How odd they look. Uh, the EJ and E had a right of way, and they built the high tension towers right over the right of way. Uh, these happen to power the South Chicago plant of US Steel where the generating plant was in Gary about 15 miles away. So uh, 15 miles they uh, uh, sent power from the power plant in Gary to the plant in uh, South Chicago. So uh, that the, the high tension lines were built right on the EJ&E right of way. So that's the odd look of those towers. Another 1954 Eugene Van Dusen uh, photo from Morning Sun Books. I put this photo in here to, to give the idea. The depot sat right here in the middle of the Y. Y connection, the train 63, I believe it was, the Egyptian from Chicago down to Cairo would have taken this Y. Um, y connection heading east toward Elkhart. The main line, the B&O is now abandoned, which was right in here the EJ and E up here, and then the massive Inland Steel Plant 2 on the north here. Uh, this depot actually had a reverse commute uh, commuter operation. Um, all the way up until World War, or through World War II, a lot of the employees of the steel mills and refineries of Northwest Indiana um, 
would lived in Chicago and they would take the New York Central to Indiana during the day, get off here and go to Inland Steel and uh, the, the, the other refineries and steel mills. Um, some of the trains up until the 1940s actually turned here at Indiana Harbor and went back to Chicago. And then another few of them continued another 10 miles to Gary and then another 15 or 20 miles to my hometown of Chesterton, Indiana. The nickel plate, uh, the New York, Chicago, and uh, St. Louis, as we said before, was uh, New York Central ownership until 1913. And they had one depot that was built to this style. And we see it here, this 1912 postcard. This depot was different because it had canopies on both sides of the depot. You can see the original nickel plate wood depot just the next block over. Another view looking back the other direction, canopy on the other end. This 1950 Harry Zimmer photo, uh, another nickel plate Burke passing the depot. And this 1976 photo, uh, the depot's in a little rough shape. I believe it burnt in 1980 and then was raised soon after that. The Lake Erie and Western ran from Sandusky to Peoria. And at Lafayette, it crossed the Big Four line from down here to Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and then from trackage rights from Kankakee into Chicago. So if you're in Lafayette, where I worked for three years, they didn't call it the Lake Erie and Western Depot. It's been known as the Big Four Depot because more central trains ran on or stopped at Lafayette. Uh, Go into this map over here. The, the Lake Erie and Western and the Big Four shared track, joint trackage from Altamont, which is on the southwest, southeast side of Lafayette, to Lafayette Junction, where they crossed the Monon and the Wabash then over the Wabash River through West Lafayette and to Templeton where the New York Central continued up to Kankakee in Chicago where the nickel plate continued toward Peoria. This early view of the depot at Lafayette, it's a large depot with uh, two paired windows on each end. Another postcard view. Now Lafayette differs a little bit. Uh, this 1971 view of the James Wood Con Riley uh, under Amtrak control stopping in front of the depot. As I said, Lafayette differed a little bit. This is the street side. It had a dormer on the street side, but instead of the raised windows for the restrooms, it had a center entrance door with restroom windows on each side of the center entrance door. So here's the one paired window on this side, a window, single window, center entry door, and single window, and then another pair of paired windows on, on the other side here. Uh, in 1994, part of railroad relocation in Lafayette, uh, removing three miles of street running on the Monon and almost 40 gray crossings on the Wabash. Uh, they were rerouted along the old uh, uh, INM, the Indiana and Michigan Canal. Uh, so the depot was moved to its current location. We see the rerouted Monon tracks here and the rerouted Wabash tracks with the depot sitting as a, kind of a, a transportation hub for the city. Both Greyhound city buses stop here and then Amtrak stops along the old Monon. So on the street side, it's used as a uh, community event space, uh, a lot of community gatherings, uh, bands, and uh, on the weekends uh, up until uh, this past year. So let's do a little recap. Northeast uh, of the short depots here, Northeast had a right side baggage. Delta also a right side baggage with orange bricks. Stryker a left hand side baggage with orange bricks. Lenaway Junction right side, no dormers on either side. Um, I got to move my little few here. Uh, had operators, be, operators bays on both sides, and it only had one entrance door per side. Sturgis, the standard left-hand side's baggage. White Pigeon, uh, no entry doors to the left of the operator's, baggage, or the operator's bay. 
had yellow bricks. Oh, with uh, with uh, white pigeon, I forgot to mention. Uh, all the depots had stone on the bottom, except for white pigeon. It had brick and stone on the lower, and then the derailment damage yellow and uh, uh, kind of yellow gray bricks. And in that derailment damage, the in baggage door was built uh, as a four foot door instead of a five foot door. And Mishawaka had the left hand side baggage. The large depots, Westfield had the extended uh, baggage room, a street side dormer uh, built with gray bricks. Conneaut, Franklin, and uh, Geneva, all right hand side baggages. Indiana Harbor Belt, left hand side, or Indiana Harbor, left, left hand side. Hammond, right hand side with canopies on both ends. And then Lafayette, the right hand side uh, on the street hand, the street side of the depot, a single center door with a street side dormer. Uh, Ashtabula, uh, one of the first variants that we're going to look at. This is the street side view with the street car in front. You can see here, there is no paired windows. They're all singled windows. And you can see on the roof here, the operator's bay is an extra large operator's bay that kind of sticks out. Uh, this is the street side, so there's no operator's bay, but uh, We'll see here in a minute. The track side, single window, door, single window, single window, door. And then this window here is at 90 degrees to the wall. And then parallel to the tracks, window, operator's bay, and then repeated as a mirror on the other side of the depot. This 1919 uh, validation photo uh, kind of shows all the details. And then on the ends, Instead of a bank of three windows, single window, single window, single window with bricks between the windows. Uh, they had a separate baggage house that was built with the same style of uh, you know, same construction, same uh, um, roof, roof supports, baggage door, window, baggage door, window. Another street side photo. Trackside postcard photo from 1908. Another 1969 Chuck Bowie photo showing both the depot and the baggage house. Looking back the other way. And then on the, the baggage into the depot, I guess uh, the 1919 photo said uh, uh, had a uh, Railway Express sign here. So this this end probably would be for passengers baggage, but it's still the same window, door, window configuration. 2010 photo, uh, look in the street side. And the other side, 2010 of the track side. Uh, it was railroad use, windows are boarded up, new replacement doors. And unfortunately, in 2018, CSX decided it was no longer needed and uh, met the excavator. Down in Tipton, Indiana, uh, again on the Lake Erie and Western, running from Sandusky to Peoria, and then a branch from Indianapolis up to Michigan City, where I'm at. The two crossed here at uh, Tipton. Looking at this depot on the end, or the the the. Uh, the, the passenger waiting room in, bank of three windows with no bricks between them. But we have a single window, single window, single window, entry door, operator's bay, entry door, and then three single windows. Another street side or track side looking east here, have the standard large depot in the baggage in with door or window, door, window. This view actually kind of looks the opposite direction. The street side view, here is the Michigan City branch uh, here, and then the Sandusky to Peoria main here. On the street side, it actually is one of the depots that has a street side dormer. Again, on the track side, 1940 photo looking, uh, this would be looking east. Same, same view, uh, 2009 photo. You see the windows are boarded up with a, with a door replacing the old baggage 
baggage door. And uh, I shot this photo back in, uh, I believe it was June or July. Uh, the the uh, um, still under railroad use, Norfolk Southern. And then the street side view. All right, moving to Elkhart, Indiana, division point for the Western Division. First glance, it doesn't look anything like a standard depot. Well, if we look at uh, some of the details here in a second, it had an attached baggage house. Uh, this is probably a late 1940s photo. And then uh, probably a mid 60s photo. The baggage house has been removed and the uh, canopy still connecting the two has been shortened here. But if we look at it, this is the street side view. While the dormer is not quite the same, it's got the same features, but then the windows. Are, are the same. And we'll take a quick look, walk around the, the depot. So the National New York Central Railroad Museum, uh, no affiliation with the uh, society, is across the main line. So the trackside looking east. And again, the standard windows and doors and the operator's bay, this one happens to be a little bit wider than your standard operator's bay, but uh, still the same details added, or the same construct, the uh, architectural details that appeared on the standard depots appear at on this depot. Again, we got Mohawk uh, 3001 kind of peeking in the corner here. And our last depot that we're gonna look at is at Bloomington, Indi uh, Illinois, at kind of on the west end of uh, uh, the Lake Erie and Western. And this was a joint depot with the Peoria and Eastern as well. Again, what's a, it doesn't look like a standard depot except for the dormers. And this one had two dormers on the track side the uh, roof brackets are different, the windows and doors are different, but uh, I included this one because it has the same identical uh, dormers. The PR and Eastern track on the right, the nickel plate track on the left. And we can see here that uh, no stone or brick, it's just an entire brick depot, so no stone around the windows in the corners or below the windows, but it does have the same. Uh, roof dormers is uh, all the other depots. Again, uh, depot was boarded up and it has since been raised. It sat uh, right in this area here. All right, uh, getting on to the modeling portion, uh, the society commissioned with the N-Scale architect a model of a brick and stone lines West Depot. This is a, uh, uh, besides being uh, produced by the N scale architect, it was produced in both an HO and N scale, and it's available through the society today. The street side view, uh, the model happened to be uh, modeled after Lafayette. Uh, that's just the plans that we ended up with. So the model does have a street side dormer and a single entry door with the windows. So it's uh, really based at Lafayette, but uh, if you put the track side against the, or the, the street side against the back of your layout and have the, the front side, uh, the track side view, you wouldn't know the difference. When you open up the box, it looks like a, a bunch of plywood. Uh, laser cut goes together quite nicely. Uh, except what I did with the kit that I had. Uh, in the two recent issues of the New York Central Modeler, I showed how to kit bash it. Uh, we took the large depot and like the Price is Right game, squeeze play, we pulled a couple sections out and squeezed the depot together. So the ends got removed. So the end detail here became the detail on the end of the uh, the window here. Uh, on the street side, this door 
or sorry, this window was converted to an entry door. Then I reworked the entire uh, restroom side here again on the other side. And then on the street side, it just got compressed. And on the ends here, we removed a section of the wall, squeezed it together again up here, uh, converted it from a triple window to uh, two single windows. And as, uh, the, the, the restroom area here, this happens to be Northeast, uh, built a uh, bump out for the, the restroom. Here's like the inner walls. Here's the restroom bump out just made with a uh, um, basswood sheet and then cut a new piece of N-Scale Architect brick uh, brick material. So these are the four the, the four walls when I was completed with uh, completed the kit bashing. So a rebuilt restroom area. Uh, this happens to be the street side, the end wall on the baggage in, the end wall on the waiting room in and then the wall for the uh, the track side. So when it was all put together, uh, I didn't know how to do the roof. So the roof was built from uh, basswood sheets, uh, completely rebuilt, and then used the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the roofing material that came with the N-Scale Architect uh, kit. So all this was detailed in this past issue and the second past issue of uh, New York Central Modeler on how I did it. So uh, I took the kit uh, to our min our last in-person meeting in September of last year and uh, shot it in front of the depot at Delta, Ohio. So we have the, the depot of Delta, Ohio in the background and then the model that it represents in front. But before I did it, I took some photos uh, on a little diorama that I built. And uh, with the, uh, uh, the kit was actually donated by a director from the society. I cut it up and modified it to a shorter version and then donated it back to the society. So when it comes time uh, to have our next in-person meeting, I believe the kit will be uh, available for purchase or auction at uh, the next in-person society meeting. So uh, that wraps it up. Uh, I'll take any questions now. Seth, we have one question out there, <clears throat> which is from Paul. And he wants to know any idea what drove the decisions to have different designs at some locations? For uh, example, Painesville designs. and Madison. Uh, say that again. For example, Painesville and Madison, Ohio. Okay, I'm not too familiar with uh, Madison, but Painesville, um, I can't tell. I don't know. Um, it, when, when I was looking at the, uh, the uh, this depots, the earlier ones like at Stryker, the other brick and stone, they were built at the same time. So I can't tell you uh, from one position to the other. Um, yeah, Painesville is a little bit different architectural details. That's why I didn't include it in this presentation. But uh, you know, it was a couple different, uh, couple different plans. That uh, okay, we'll take this one or that one. I couldn't answer uh, between a large depot and a small version. You know, that pretty much dealt with uh, either city size or projected city size. You know, if the town was going to be small, then you know, hopefully we'll get a smaller depot, or if the town was expected to grow, uh, we might get a larger depot. But uh, again, these weren't original depots. Uh, the lines were built in the 1840s, 1850s, and these depots were built uh, 30 years later. So these are replacement depots, either from a depot burning down or just uh, the original depot on the line wasn't uh, adequate. Okay, anything else, Bob? Uh, we have John, who would like to know where you got your 20th century observation car in the photo. That uh, century observation car is a um, Eastern Car Works, uh, who had it before, uh, Eastern Car Works kit that actually I picked up at a hobby shop uh, um, a couple years ago and just used it on a, you know, I don't know who built it, but it's an Eastern Car Works, uh, the name's 
eluding me now, who had the Eastern Car Works line before, but uh, that's where that car came from. It's uh, Island Series Observation. Um, right, EMB Valley. Thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, the car was, uh, I believe it was uh, pre-decorated, but the, the Pullman name and the Island name are decals on it, but uh, I bought it that way. That's uh, what I can tell you about it. Okay. Alex has roof question. Uh, where did that go? Okay. It just says roof question. Uh, did the break in, oh, breaking the roof lines line up with the bottom of the dormer. Oh, I remember going through this no, myself. They did not. Uh, the, the bottom of the dormer was actually set uh, below the break in the roof. Um, the, the model actually... Um, represents that it sits a little bit lower i believe the front of the dormer lines up with the front edge of the the wall so um the the break in the roof or the bend in the roof sits a little bit higher than uh than the front of the wall okay let's see here's another question on cabooses where any of the 20,100 series rebuilt from box cars. If that's the lot 732, which I believe it is, yes, they were. Yes, all of them, 36 foot, right. uh, 36 foot box cars. 